Well, thanks for joining us today, Matt. Let's start with your background because you actually hold quite a few job titles. <laughs> I do indeed. I do indeed. Sometimes I confuse myself with all the things that I do. So first and foremost, I'm a lecturer at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. I've been there for uh, about 13 years teaching strategic communication, among other things. I run a consulting practice based on the same topics, and I host a podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart, and I write books. So that's a lot. <laughs> But yeah, they're all related to the same concept. So so while it sounds like different jobs, I'm really focusing on on how to communicate better when we are in situations that are high stakes. Where did your interest in communications come from? Were you a bad communicator? And then you decide I need to fix this? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, well, the, I, I definitely was not, I have definitely become a better communicator. The, the jury's out if I'm a good communicator, but I've definitely become a better communicator. Um, my journey started actually when I was I was young. So when when I was about seven or eight, this is the first very vivid experience I have. Um, where we grew up, uh, there were lots of garage sales every weekend. And my mother got so frustrated with my brother and me and all of the stuff we had all over, toys and other junk. She said, we are having a garage sale this Saturday. And she enlisted my brother and me to help make signs. And my mother instructed us to spell garage wrong. And if you insert a B in the word garage, you get garbage. So while all of our neighbors were having garage sales, we had a garbage sale. <laughs> and shockingly, we sold more than anybody else. And, and my mother uh, asserts that this is because we stood out. Uh, our sale signs were different. I think people thought we were stupid and came to buy more. But regardless, it taught me at a very young age that the words we use, the way we communicate can impact people. Mm -hmm. So that's really my first interest in that. And then I, I discovered communication as a field of study accidentally. So I went to college thinking I was going to be a doctor. I met calculus and chemistry, and they told me differently. <laughs> and, and, and where I went to school, there was a the sort of a way you could sneak into your medical school requirements. It was a merging of biology and social science. And the first day of class, they brought out a psychologist. And I fell in love. I did, I, in my high school, we didn't have psychology. I thought psychology was only for therapists. And I realized you can study psychology as a social science. And when I got into that, I happened to begin working with somebody who studied shyness. And shyness is really a communication issue. And out of that came my passion for communication. So it was uh, there was always an interest, but I didn't know you could study it. And then I sort of stumbled into it and have been in love with it ever since. Yeah, I actually got my master's in communication management and it was gonna, my plan was to go to business school. Yeah. My test scores told me differently and yes. I settled on that. And it was actually, I really, really loved it. It was very different than what I was expecting, but I loved it. And I do remember specifically a class that was all about your presentation style and we filmed ourselves and we critiqued ourselves. And yeah. it was, it was like, this is a class that everybody should have had. Um, you know, yes. especially as you start to work in the corporate world, but uh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your work, which is you've got this book that's coming out, um, Thinking Faster and Talking Smarter. And you argue that both of those are not innate skills and they require, that require natural talent and that actually anyone can learn this, which is really excellent news for all of us. What do people need though to learn this skill? Uh, so thank you. Yes. So the book Think Faster, Talk Smarter is all about helping people provide, giving people the skills they need to become better speakers in spontaneous speaking situations. If you think about it, most of our communication personally and professionally is spontaneous, right? It, when you do a job interview, when somebody asks you for feedback, when you make a mistake and you have to correct it, when you make small talk, all of these are examples of spontaneous speaking. So the first thing you have to have in order to get better at this is a desire to do so. Many of us are so intimidated by communication in general, but especially these high stakes, spontaneous situations that we don't want to, you know, hey, it scares me. I don't want to, I don't want to go through that door. But if you have that initiative, if you have that desire, then then the next step is really a focused approach to it. And in the way I present it in the book, it, you really have to address mindset and messaging. And so there's a whole bunch of things we have to do around mindset in terms of helping ourselves feel more confident, reframing these situations as, a, as positive versus negative. And then we have to look at what we actually say, the messages that we communicate. So taken together, those two, uh, focusing on messaging 
and focusing on mindset are really what are, what are key to address this, but you have to first have the initiative to do so. Right. And those are both skills that people can learn. Like you might not be yeah. born naturally with the messaging skills. You can definitely develop them, which I think is really good news. I think people who have a desire want to also know that it's possible <laughs> to get better with that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. How can someone manage, you, you mentioned mindset. So how can someone manage their anxiety around public speaking? That's probably one of the biggest fears you, you hear from people. Like what's your biggest fear? It's like talking in front of people, right? <laughs> Yeah, so much so that in surveys, it is ranked number one above spiders, snakes, heights, even death. So yeah, we, we, we are designed to be nervous about speaking in front of others and happy to share a little bit more about that. But how do you manage it? And, and, and managing it is, is key. I, I don't believe you can ever overcome it. So we have to start from the understanding that almost everybody is nervous speaking in high stakes situations. Reports say up to 85% of people are nervous. And I quite frankly think the other 15% are lying. How do we, so it's not about overcoming it. It's about managing it. And to manage it, we have to take a two pronged approach. We have to focus on symptoms. Those are the things that we physiologically experience and sources, the things that make us nervous uh, and, and make it worse when we are nervous. So Lauren, uh, let me ask you, when, when you get nervous speaking in public, uh, what are some of the symptoms that happen for you? I blush, I turn red and I sweat. Those are my Yeah, mine, I definitely get red. Um, and I would say nervousness in that my I talk a lot with my hands or I, I use filler words. It's almost like mm -hmm. I get nervous and I can't stop talking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, and that's uh, that can happen a lot to people uh, for sure. Where where you, uh, you you in essence, it becomes a way of distracting people from paying attention to you. I'm just going to throw all these words at the wall and see if that something sticks. So the, your responses, my responses, are are normal and natural. These are what happen when you are are under threat, and that's really what's happening here. Is is we experience high stakes communication as threat, and our and our bodies and minds respond in turn. So let me give you a couple things you can do to manage symptoms. So for example, deep belly breathing can really help not just slow your breath, but it slows your mind down. It's hard to think fast and breathe slow. So if you can take some deep belly breaths, if you've ever done yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong, these really deep belly breaths can slow down your autonomic nervous system, which will slow down your thought process, which will slow down your speaking. You cannot breathe slowly and speak quickly. Uh, your voice is a wind instrument. The faster you breathe, the faster you speak. For people like me who blush and perspire, uh, it's because you're getting hotter. Uh, when you get nervous, your heart beats faster, your body tenses up. So you're putting more blood through tighter tubes. It increases your core body temperature, just like exercise. Exactly the same thing happens when you exercise. So we need to cool ourselves down. And a great way to do that is to hold something cold in the palms of your hand. The palms of your hand are like thermoregulators for your body. Just like if you ever get sick and you put a cold compress on your forehead, um, palms of your hand do the same thing. In fact, I bet on a cold morning, Lauren, and those of you listening have probably held a cup of warm coffee or tea and felt that it's warmed you up. We're just doing it in reverse. So the answer to your question is you have to deal with symptoms and sources, and there are things you can do that can help you feel better and less nervous. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, there's the old saying, preparation, preparation, preparation. I mean, I would yeah. assume practice makes perfect. Are people less anxious? Is, you know, do you always practice your presentation? I guess we're talking about spontaneous conversations. Well, so, so that's the practice. irony. So, so yeah. yes, preparation is key in both planned and spontaneous. And the biggest irony of my book is that you can prepare to be spontaneous and people are like, huh? How's that work? But you can. So just like you said, if you have a pitch or a presentation coming up, you would practice it, I would hope, and you would sketch it out. And, and that's great. But in spontaneous situations, you don't have that similar opportunity. But you can prepare, much like an athlete would do drills. You know, if you're a soccer player, you dribble around cones and you practice shooting so that in the game, when you actually have people, you, those skills become more natural and feel more comfortable. So you can prepare and you should prepare. I know a lot of what you do is career-based. So interviewing is really important. You can practice and prepare for interviews. In fact, I, I have found a wonderful new tool that is generative AI, chat GPT, BARD and the like. 
Uh, if you're interviewing for a particular job role, type into one of these tools, the job role, and say, generate questions for this particular company in this role. And you'll be amazed. It'll give you some reasonable questions. And then you can practice, not to memorize, but just to get used to doing it, just like dribbling around cones when practicing soccer. Yeah, I like the the metaphor of you put yourself through drills, just like you were an athlete. Yeah. Um, so one thing I know that I personally struggle with is communicating in concise yet memorable ways, especially yeah. when I'm put on the spot. Is yeah. there a trick to this? What are your like? How do I how do I leave the good impression, not the like frantic impression? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you are not alone. Many of us, many of us, overspeak, and, and part of that is because we're discovering our responses while we're making them. And so being concise and clear, focused as, as it is, uh, is really important. And there are really two fundamental ways. Uh, and, and in the book, I spend a whole chapter talking and the whole second part of the book, the book's divided into two parts. One is a methodology and the other is actual use cases or scenarios and situations you, you might find yourself in. But they focus on structure. If you have a structure, a roadmap, if you will, a recipe, whatever analogy you want to use, it helps you be more tight and clear in what you're saying. Similarly, what's critical in all communication is you really focus on your audience and understand what's important to them. If I know what's important to you, I will focus my message around that. So my message will be less rambling. So if you have a structure, something that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and you really know what your audience needs in the moment, the both of those will help you be more concise. Hmm, interesting. So can we play a little rapid fire scenario sure. then using yeah. this structure? Okay. So let's say you're navigating a difficult conversation at work. How do you apply this structure to that? Okay. So uh, if the if the complicated structure, give me more specifics. Am I trying to persuade something to somebody to do something, or am I trying to give somebody some uh direct feedback what what, yeah, what you're makes trying to give someone um a coworker at work messed up on a project and you need to give them feedback so it doesn't happen again excellent very good thank you for that that clarity so first and foremost when when giving feedback it's important to think about what might be motivating the behavior that you see uh we will change our our feedback based on what we think might be be behind it so for example if you have an employee who's showing up late to work uh, and you came to learn that it was because they were taking care of a, a sick or ailing relative versus uh, they were out late partying, would would your approach to feedback be different? Certainly, you have to give the feedback. They need to be there on time, but you would approach it differently. So once you've thought about what might be motivating it, the next step is to structure your message. And I have a, there's a structure I love because it's so flexible for so many situations like feedback. It's three simple questions. What, so what, now what? So what is the feedback? So what is, why is it important to the person or to the company? And now what is what comes next? So I'll give you a real quick example. Imagine we come out of a meeting and uh, you ask me, how did how'd the meeting go? I would say, I thought the meeting went well, but when you talked about the implementation plan, you spoke quickly without a lot of detail. That's my what. When you speak quickly, without a lot of detail, it makes it look like you're nervous and underprepared. That's my so what. What I need you to do next time you present this, or what I encourage you to do the next time you present this, is to slow down and include these two very specific examples. That's the now what. So do you see how the structure compartmentalizes the feedback? It makes it more concise and clear. And as the recipient of the feedback, because it's packaged nicely and easily, I can digest it. So structure helps you not only package your information, it helps you think about what's best to say. Absolutely. This makes so much more sense to me than just giving someone blank feedback to. If you give it to them in these, these three steps, it's almost like I can digest each step and then I, I know where to move on. It also doesn't feel personal the way the structure is set up. And I think yes. oftentimes feedback can feel like a personal attack. And so yes. it really separates the work from the person. Um, so I think this structure is really great. Can we, we can we play a couple more scenarios? Keep going, bring okay, them on. This is, this is great. Okay. Let's see if I, I can think fast and talk smart. Let's see yeah, if I can live up to the see. podcast name. Let's try it. Um, okay. What about a job interview? So they've asked you, tell me about yourself. Every job yeah. interview pretty much starts with that. You're interviewing for... Um, I'll just use a scenario that's similar to me. Like you're interviewing for a recruiting job for yeah. I don't know, a media company. 
Awesome. So uh, what I would, how I would start is I always like whenever anybody says, introduce yourself or tell me about yourself, rather than going into immediately my LinkedIn profile and just itemizing my experience, I like to start with some declarative sentence that really demonstrates something about me and allows me to convey a little bit of emotion. Because what we know is information is important, but emotion can really impact how people remember you and see you. So if if I had to do that, if you ask me for what I do, and then I'll get to your scenario, I would say I'm somebody who's really passionate about education. And throughout my career, I've really focused and evolved what that means. For example, do you see how I started with, I'm somebody who's really passionate. So they get to hear that passion. They get to see that focus. And most people don't do this. So you're going to stand out. So if I'm trying to be a recruiter at a, mo- a media company, I might say something like uh, finding fit between employees and their jobs is what motivates me the most. So I start with that provocative statement. And then I say, through the many jobs that I've done, and then I could itemize a few, I've always looked to find the best fit. And I take time to get to know the candidates. I take time to understand the hiring managers and the positions. So do you see that how starting that way, one, is memorable, has an emotion, and is a focal point for everything else that I say? So when in, in those situations, I, I think you start with something that's very concise, clear, and allows for some emotion to be expressed. That is such a good tip and not one I've heard. And I feel like I've heard every sample answer to that question. <laughs> that is such a good tip. And yeah, you clearly should be teaching this because uh, you're good at it. No, um, thank okay, you. What, what about the small talk thing? You know, people talk yeah. about networking, go out, especially right now where the, I feel like the job search is very focused on networking. People are terrified of small talk. They hear, oh, stop doing small talk, move into deep talk, which yes. also feels weird to start a conversation deep right away. Um, what would be your advice for someone in that scenario? Yes. So first we need to we need to give small talk its due. Small talk is actually really important. We we diminish it when we call it small talk. Uh, we need to come, we need to rebrand small talk. So, so we can talk about that later. Small talk is an opportunity to explore, to find people to collaborate with, to learn. So part of it is we just have to see it as something that's positive. That will help us deal with it. I think, so I want to give you uh, advice of what to do and a couple things not to do. I think the structure I talked to you about, what, so what, now what, is a wonderful tool for small talk. If somebody asks you something, you can respond in that way. If somebody says, hey, what did you think about that keynote speaker that we had at the at this um, offsite? I could say, well, here's what I found important. Here's why. And here's what I'm going to do with it. So I use what, so what, now what is a response. If I'm the person who feels like I need to initiate the small talk, I can just ask those questions. I could say, hey, Lauren, what brings you here? And you could tell me. And I'd say, oh, why is that so important? And then I I could say, and what are you going to do next? Or what can we talk about next? So all of a sudden, I'm just using what, so what, now what, the literal questions as a way to keep the conversation moving. Now, a couple things to watch out for. Many of us go into small talk thinking it's like hot potato or tennis, where when it's my turn, I just got to throw it back at you. And I think that's the wrong analogy to see it. I, I don't know if you remember the game Hacky Sack, where you've got that little bean bag and you just pass it back and forth. That's what small talk is. The goal in Hacky Sack when you play it is to keep the ball aloft. Everybody just keeps it. It's, sometimes people play it with soccer balls. If you see small talk that way, my job is not just to get done with my turn. It's to actually set you up for your turn so that you can set me up for my turn. So thinking of it that way changes the way you approach it. So see it as a as a collaborative effort. See it as a positive, potential positive interaction and use what, so what, now what to respond or to initiate. Yeah, I love that. That's also a really good point. You know, so many of us are working in digital hybrid remote workplaces, but regardless, digital communication, text, email, obviously email is a big one. They're just part of our day to day. And, you know, while you would think about the fact that, okay, email, you can prepare what you want to say and then send it. Many people are being very spontaneous on the spot when they respond. And part of it is they've, they've got so much to do, they don't want to forget about it. So what about advice for, you know, responding quickly in digital communication forms that doesn't hurt your career. (laughs) 
Absolutely. So, so yeah, texting, Slack, all of that. People, people respond right away without necessarily doing the the taking the the time. So, I I treat that as a form of spontaneous communication. First, think about your audience. What is it that's relevant and important to them? So often, if you're responding, there was an issue, a question. Start there. My mother has this saying. I know she did not create it, but it's tell me the time, don't build me the clock. Many of us in our communication are clock builders, planned or spontaneous. So when you're responding to a text, when you're responding to an email, a Slack, whatever you're responding to, what's the critical information you want to get across? I like to say to myself in my head, I say the bottom line is, and I build my message from there rather than building the whole clock. If people want to know how the clock's built, they'll follow up, they'll ask. Yeah. And then leveraging a structure, you know, um, slacks and texts tend to be very short. So I'm not sure how helpful a full on structure would be. But when I write my emails, I use what, so what, now what? I sound like a broken record uh, for people who remember what records were. But the subject line is the now what? That's what I want. And then the what and the so what for the body of the emails. So using a structure, and there are many other structures, but this one in particular could help. Yeah. Have you found that? learning about other people's communication style is very important when it comes to being a successful communicator at work. I mean, kind of yeah. like you're talking, you know, I'm thinking about the person who really wants the concise email. They want to know the time, yeah. but there are people out there who do want the clock. Yeah. And sometimes knowing what their style is also helps. Have you found that? You bet. I mean, what many of us do, well, so for the, the biggest thing many of us do is we don't pay any attention to that. We just lean into our style, which may or may not be appropriate or good. Uh, but no, the ability to one, recognize that other people have different styles and then the willingness to adjust and adapt. And I certainly know what you mean. There are people I deal with who who just, you know, give me the facts, boom, move on. And there are other people who want a little more color commentary and detail and adjusting is really important. And so, yes, that that is what I call graduate school level spontaneous speaking you know, we first just have to pay attention that, oh, it's about the other person, not me. And then we can think about, oh, how do I adjust and adapt um, every time I switch who I'm speaking with? Yeah, I feel like a lot of the topics we've covered on this podcast, they're all work related, but a lot of them come down to communication, like these, you yeah. know, again, these soft skills, these people skills that, you yeah. know, everyone wants to say, it's like, oh, everyone can communicate. It's like, no, not everyone can be an effective communicator. And that is really a huge difference, I feel like in the whatever you want to call them, the high potential that were. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Up. Yeah. And, and you nailed it right on the head. I mean, this is my belief. I mean, I think communication is operationalized leadership. It's operationalized management. I mean, everything we do is communi is predicated on communication. Many people treat communication sort of as a necessary evil, but in fact, it's foundational. And, and that's why I think people need to focus on it, both in planned and spontaneous situations. Okay, one last question that I feel like comes up a lot also in communication is the power of storytelling. You know, they always yeah. say the person who's the best storyteller wins, the person who's able to get their story across. And you talked about emotion and how that's important. Any other tips about storytelling and the spontaneous sense? Because again, I, I feel like I can be a decent storyteller when I have my presentation prepped out. I'm ready to go. I've thought about it especially like I'm thinking in a job interview where you have to tell them the story of how you achieved this result or you did this thing and you can't lose them in a 45 minute story. Correct. Correct. So you're <laughs> right. Storytelling is really important. And, and actually in writing this book, I real I came to realize how important it is because I spoke to a whole bunch of neuroscientists, people who study how the brain works and our brains are actually wired for story. Our brains are not wired for lists of, of things or bullet points. So ha telling, getting your point across in a story is really important. And what it really boils down to is you need to make it engaging. We need to pull people in. And, and you, you make it engaging first and foremost by making it relevant. Again, you need to understand your audience, what's important to them. And you have to make sure that whatever story you tell relates. Similarly, you need to use different ways of supporting your point of view. So one thing might be uh, that you leverage uh, data, you pull in data, data are important, but you also could pull in a testimonial, a third party voice, or you could give a use case. So good stories blend different types of support that reinforce what's important for the audience. You're painting a picture for your audience, and that's what helps engage people more. Lists and bullet points don't work. So I challenge everybody to think about 
how you could explain something through story and practice through story. And another real powerful tool, last one I'll share with storytelling, is if you can use analogies, analogies and comparisons really help people to see and understand things, especially if they're not typical, if they're more nuanced or even complex, analogies can be really helpful for storytelling. I love that. That is, Those are such good tips. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about what we can expect in your book, um, because you also have a podcast, which is yeah. Think Fast, Talk Smart. And the book is a little different. So tell us about the two, because I know people who are listening yes. are probably going to want both and want to know how they're different. Well, I hope that's the case. Thank you. So uh, I'm not very creative with naming. So the podcast is called Think Fast, Talk Smart. It's all about communication skills. It, we have short episodes, about 20, 30 minute episodes, and uh, experts who are who are specialists in communication. We cover topics from negotiation to persuasion, to anxiety management, to how to be creative in your responses to things. And from that, one of the topics that we discussed on the podcast was this notion of spontaneous speaking. In fact, the very first episode, almost 100 episodes ago, was on that topic. And that, and the book itself, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, is really about that one topic, although it leverages many of the learnings that I took from my guests. So if, uh, if you want to get better at communication in general, the podcast is a great place to go. If you have a specific need or desire to improve in what I call in the moment, spontaneous communication, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, the book is for you. Amazing. Well, Matt, this has been, I feel like we all just got like a mini Stanford Business <laughs> School lesson. <laughs> That was uh, very affordable. So thank you. Um, yes. And no grading or homework. So it's great yeah. for everybody. Yeah. That's the kind of class we like. Well, Matt, thank you so much again. I will put a link to the podcast and your book in the show notes, as well as your website. So people can um, follow up with you and, and follow your work. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Lauren. Keep up the good work.